various uh, BPIs of the world to try and get people to realise the value of music. Um, and as anyone who's at my last talk will know, basically people don't give a shit. I, and I the, being to one of the big it. problems of the world of music, which, which is unlike a lot of stuff, is that you, know, you can go and Google anything tonight and I bet I'll find probably most of anyone in here who's got a record out or been out, I can find it on Google in 10 seconds and it's actually quicker to nick it than it is to buy it. Um, I so do, that, I do that's one that of the point. issues and I mean the whole the whole education thing I mean yeah I'd love to educate kids from when they're six or seven years old explaining to them the value of it it's never going to happen in real in the real world because the, there just isn't the funding there to do it on a nationwide thing and then it'd be various bodies that would complain about you know indoctrinating children or whatever um, but it's been going on since you know home, home taping is killing music and you know, it's, uh, it, I, it's, I it's been a perennial coming, problem. It's just the problem is now, and that's why music suffered before anyone else, because before the high-speed internet, the only thing you could download, you couldn't nick a film, because it would take you about two days to download it. Well, and books as and well. Now, they, they yeah, have it's just the volume. Is and now, uh, you know... It's uh, coming to all of us. Back in the day, you could press a button and, and Although be there. you think that the threat is piracy, and I don't think that's the primary threat. I think the threat is competition. I think the threat that the games industry is facing is not that all this Call of Duty stuff is being pirated. It's that new companies are emerging with a business model which says, have my stuff for free. I want you to have it for free. It's legal to have it for free. By the way, I can make $1.9 billion a year from one game doing that. The th we, could, we could conceivably have fought the piracy threat. I don't believe you will get politicians fighting the competition threat because what that basically looks like to the electorate is siding with big business to sue voters when the competition is saying, but we don't need that, we're fine. So I think the piracies are unfortunately a red herring. It's the easiest thing we can fight. We can continue to legislate, but competition's going to change this stuff. Yeah, I, I, I don't think piracy is a complete red herring, but I think it's part of the part No, of the it's part of the problem, but and the competition's the long-term I think the only issue. way we could match the games industry is maybe we should leave a line out in the song, and if you want it, you buy it as an add-on and get the actual I think, line. I think there are other ways you can do right, it. Leave, but, um, the, leave the chorus out. <laughs> You could do that. Leave the hook out. That would be a mistake. Um, um, pay to um, take the hook out of everything is awesome, so it's not stuck in your head. Or is that just me who's been seeing the Lego movie recently? Yeah, exactly. Um, I've got three more slides, so I might just try and finish those because um, we're heading towards 8 o'clock. I'm still happy to carry on. And those were very specific, practical things, which I just want to sort of sum up. If you are making music for a living, the first question you have to ask, the free bit, is what are you going to give away for free? Broadly, you have no choice. It will be your music. That's going to happen because of piracy. But what can you choose to give away for free, which does the job of saying, if you like it, come to me in some way. Let me earn the right to talk to you again. How do I see my free stuff? Not as being, I'll give away a taster of a thing and then sell that same thing, but how do I start that process of building a one-to-one -one relationship? I think in the long term, as musicians, this might hurt you, the most valuable thing you will have is your email address, not your list, not your song back catalogue. Your email address's database will be more valuable than your IP. And that is a painful realisation for people who create. What I realised that is a very nice way of getting somebody's address or actually the right to talk to them again, okay, and then accepting it and very pleasantly, is when somebody's talking about something that I do on Twitter or Facebook. Twitter is more easy to, yeah. to, to see what people talk about you. And when I see somebody mentioning something that I do, I always respond back and I say, well, actually, that's really great. What was your favorite bit? They give me an answer. If they don't engage, probably they just did it yeah, automatically or they didn't even read it. But if they do engage, I tell them, that's great. That was, I, I, I engage back. And then I tell them, so if you want more of this, this is where you can write your email address. I can be back when I release something else. You and, need to and, make and hundred percent of people do that. So that, just, that works. Just, nobody doesn't give me the address. Hard to get to hundred thousand people that way, but you do that as a starting point, and then you use those things in your website or other communication to be a multiplier happening over time. And, and guess what? So when they give me the address, I always make sure I send them a personal email, ask him, so what's your story? When it was the beginning of the year, I said, what are your resolutions for 2014? Everybody told me, you're the first person to ever do that. And guess what? They made sure they brought more people. The next time they tweeted about it, or they did whatever they had to do. You're building... Def definitely this way, word of mouth, when you start, for me, word of mouth is, is a big exactly. like, opportunity. This is where you need to, to 
what, what was going to drive some kind of success, initial success. And, and guess what? Like today, I haven't marketed this thing, right? So people obviously needed it. They wanted to be here. But also, some people brought their friends and they talked about it. And Westminster School, they have around 10 people today. Somebody, Lisa, talked about it. They brought more people and everybody brought their friends. So I think it's about word of mouth. And then you start talking. And if, especially if you know everybody that knows your music, that have heard it, they, they belong to a private group on Facebook or whatever this place might be, then, then we're talking. I agree. I agree. You need, um, you, you do that hard, miserable work at the beginning to start building evangelists. It starts building over time. Um, so I'm doing a lot of one-to-one -one stuff around the curve and the volume of noise around the curve is increasing. There are people who are talking about my book who I've never spoken to. Um, the first time somebody tweeted that read, they'd read my book and I didn't know them was a very nice moment because up until then it had been me thinking only my friends had bought it. You know, that stuff matters. And, it's, and then over time, there's people here, uh, Andre said earlier that three different people had told him he should read my book. That's amazing. I didn't bribe any of them. Um, that matters. So, um, so the, the, the summary, what's free? How are you going to talk to them again? What are you going to sell for 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times the previous average price? And how can you test that? Um, separately, you should all read The Lean Startup, which says nobody knows anything, including me. All we know and can learn is how to test more cheaply with more um, quick experiments that help us learn faster than the competition. Because our primary advantage against the labels um, is that we can move faster. We can, and the indies can move faster than the majors, and the, independents, uh, the independent artists can move faster than the indies, because we don't have a legacy to protect. Um, to, to answer your question there, um, would it be better to get an A&R contract? Probably. But if you don't, you can either spend your whole life trying to get an A&R contract, or you can follow this strategy while also trying to get an A&R contract. I'm reasonably convinced that this will help you get one more. That's my position anyway. So my summary is that you've got to love your freeloaders, the people who love your stuff and will share it freely even if they give you um, no money. You need to love your super fans because they're the people who are going to enable you to eat. Um, you need to love everybody in between because everybody matters. I'm going to finish by saying I love you all. Thank you very much. <laughs>
It's because people think that I must be good. Because Somebody has literally said to me, you must know stuff about business because you wear cufflinks. Somebody has literally said that to me, which means I suspect I can charge more because I wear cufflinks. Um, which is not entirely... So, so how do you do that? Um, I had a friend a long time ago who wanted to be a football agent, and his number one objective was to buy a $70,000 car because he couldn't be a football agent if he didn't drive a $70,000 car. So he had to buy one in order to look like a successful football agent before he could become even an unsuccessful football agent because that was what was expected. Luckily, he changed his mind and didn't go down that business. My point is that you have to figure out what it is you're selling to people because you're not selling beats. You're selling a safe pair of hands. You're selling a guaranteed hit. You're selling speed or quality or convenience. You're selling, uh, if, I, if I buy from you and it fails, I won't get fired because I bought IBM. Or you're getting, I tried the new startup, I'm getting a reputation as an avant-garde um, new person trying to discover new talent. That's what you're actually selling to people. And I think you need to start thinking less around, it cost me X to make it, so I, can, uh, I have to sell it for X plus 20% and more start thinking, what is my market positioning? You will have to give some stuff away for free for people to sample stuff, I suspect. No, you won't have to. There is a logic in giving some stuff away for free to, to find an audience. But how can you start? I, mean, I don't quite know if you can do this. Here's a slightly rubbish beat. Here's a great beat. Um, they'll charge um, 10 times as much for the great one. I'm not sure that will work. That but one, you know, everything needs to be good. Really good. Everything needs to be really good. So how can you get it so that you charge for something which they actually care about? Is it about speed? Is it that for a small amount of money, they can buy one off the shelf, but for more money, you go to their house and talk to them about what they want and massage their ego a bit, and then you sell them something more because of that personal touch? How do you compete with... Um, change the subject entirely to books. There's a business in Bath called Mr B's Emporium of Reading Delights, and it now sells um, reading spas. So you come to Bath, stay in a hotel, um, you might have a... a back rub in the hotel, and then you come to his place for a mind rub, where he sits down and indulges your ego by talking about all the books you like, and at the end you're presented with a set of ten books, kind of carefully gift-wrapped. And he's done, extended that to the web, where he says, we'll interview you over the phone, and every month we will send you a book that we have chosen that speaks to you. We'll wrap it in beautiful paper, we'll seal it with Victorian sealing wax and put a stamp in it. You'll have an unboxing experience. Think a bit like um, Rowan Atkinson in Love Actually, trying to pour all that stuff into the top of um, uh, Alan Rickman's uh, adulterous present. Um, sorry, was that a spoiler? Um, and um, <laughs> and um, all of that stuff is what they're paying for, because they could get the same books from Amazon for half the price, but they're paying a premium. So the answer to my question is, you think you're selling beats, and I don't think that's what you're selling. You're selling a bunch of other stuff, and you need to figure out what it is that you're actually selling. Because there's a whole bunch of beats out there in the web which anybody could pick up, and you're selling something different. You're selling you in some form. What is it about you that would make somebody want to pay more for you? That's the marketing thing you need to do. I even have a different suggestion. Even if you do sell beats, very simple suggestion. You help some people that have influence. You help them with whatever they might want help with, all right? And then these partners, let's say, they become your partners. These partners drive you sales. They talk about you, and they have an audience. You find these people, who they are. I don't know who they might be. I'm not a producer. But you help them with producing free beats for them. But they talk to their audience, to their artists, to whoever you might need, and they come and pay. And guess what? You're not going to be the person asking for a sale. Somebody else will say, I trust this lady. Mm -hmm. She's really good at what she does. And actually, they will sell it for you. Let me give you another version of that. So there's, um, this one's taken straight from the book. Um, there's a guy called Marcus Sheridan who installs fiberglass swimming pools in Maryland, a very non-curve business. He was spending $250,000 a year on pay-per-click marketing for Maryland swimming pools. And he turned it all off. And he said, instead, I'm going to think like a consumer. I'm going to turn up and go, what's wrong with fiberglass swimming pools? Why should I not install one? And he wrote a blog post which said five reasons why you shouldn't install a fiberglass swimming pool. All he does is sell fiberglass swimming pools. <laughs> um, he's the top hit for people asking that actual question because all his competitors are trying to persuade people to buy fiberglass swimming pools. And he says, don't. If you want this or this, you'd be crazy. Get a concrete one. If you want this or this, on the other hand, I know somebody could install them at a very good price. Um, and they're already on his website. He similarly put up a list of every single person who sold fiberglass swimming pools in Maryland. 
all of them, all of his competition on his website. So he is now the top ranked search for Google, which says Maryland swimming pool installers. The top ranked search is his website with all his competitors on it. His competitors go, I don't understand, you're listing all the competitors on it. I go, yes, I am, but they're on my site. <laughs> That's where I'm listing them. And I now have places around here where I can say sign up for a free brochure. He has an 80% conversion rate, meaning once people land on his website, 80% of people buy a swimming pool $100,000 ago because they have to read 30 pages. That's an important proviso. But, um, but once people have explored his stuff, because they trust him, so how would I do it? Write a blog post which says, how do I not get fleeced when buying beets? What to look for when buying beets? Think about what your customers are actually trying to do and don't sell to them. Tell them, look, don't come and sell to me because I'm the wrong guy for you. I've done that with my customers. It's amazingly powerful. If you turn around and say, don't hire me for this, I'm the wrong guy for that. They go, well, what are you right for? I go, well, I'm right for this. And they go, okay, I want that too. But you've already told them to go away for something you can't do. Trust levels have just ratcheted. Fees have just gone up a bit too. Um, you can make that happen. So it's about thinking that one is a different way. What you give away for free is the advice on how to be a good customer of yours. Because you don't want bad customers, so send them off already. So a different strategy. All about putting yourself more in the place of your buyers rather than trying to think, how do I solve my problem? You're thinking, how do I solve their problem? Another solution. As I say, an interesting point on that kind of actually links <clears throat> links both when selling to the consumers and when selling to businesses. And you've mentioned it quite a few times. But the word trust and ease. And I think to take the two sort of separately. If you're selling to a business and you want to charge a premium price, very often I think a lot of people in business, unless maybe you're the actual business owner or you're directly responsible for the 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 P and L, the budget mm. lines, and it's kind of your money people want to deal with people that make it very easy to transact. So rather than saying, well, I'm going to spend half a morning seeing if I can get a better price from 400 different people, if I know somebody over here can deliver, they'll do what they say they're going to do, they'll deliver on time, it'll be of a good to brilliant quality. The quality is less of an issue, as long as I know that I can tick that off my list of things to do today. Well, what matters around that is, and provided I won't get fired if this goes wrong. Well, exactly, so, because you've got that trust in yeah. that person to deliver a good product. Or and even their time, reputation is good enough that you go, it went wrong, but they were a respected brand. They go, OK, fair enough, you like won't that. get fired. Yeah. So at that time, I think that when you're dealing with people and you want to charge a premium price, it's from the very beginning of your communication, then to link into what Tommy said, doing things for people that's maybe over and above that actually helps them out, makes them think top of their mind when they need a beat or what have you, think, well, I know this person will come through, be nice and easy, and it's an easy go. To bring it to the consumer, the people who are willing to pay the, the super fans or what have you, it's because, again, you've built, like Nate did, the one-on-one -on -one trust with that person. You've built up that relationship. So what it all comes down to, whether you're dealing with the consumer or you're dealing with the business, is those one-on-one -on -one relationships mm -hmm. it is that which is where well, you're saying having the tools to be able to you know connect directly with people yeah so exactly the difficulty is, is scaling it but i mean the guy who paid 350 was he somebody that you knew personally beforehand um so yeah so so i was i was running tiny um house concerts at my home in in scarborough in south africa the different scarborough and he i didn't even know that he'd been at one of them and suddenly there was this guy who was answering my mailing list emails this guy francois and suddenly i was getting replies he's like oh i really like the new lyrics for that song." so, so we were talking eventually i worked out oh he can't come to that thing so so, but but he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't like your mum. I mean, he wasn't. No, a no. I've, I, I still. Don't, I still. I think I've met him maybe once, maybe twice. I don't know what he looks. So he like. wouldn't. He wouldn't <laughs> count as one of your friends supporting you. He was no. a genuinely found fan. For absolutely. Whatever mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, say so generally found, but then by building that. No. Exactly. And I'm saying that's what But I what the point is that a lot of people think that I'm saying get stuff from your friends, and what I'm saying is no, you can build these these relationships in that sense. But what, scalable is a question. Um, do you sell your stuff from the website, um, your beats, or do they have to talk to you in person in order to buy it? Um, we've never sold from the website. They've always just come to you. They've come to you personally. Because one of the things we see a lot in the world of e-books, particularly business e-books, um, is people saying 100% guarantee. If you don't want it, give your money back. Um, and when you have just given somebody a PDF, then actually just giving them the money back is pretty cheap to you. Um, there's a... Um, Let's talk about clothes. Um, Marks and Spencer sells little black 
black dresses. It has statutory responsibility to let you return stuff, but it has a much broader responsibility or, or policy which says, if you don't like it, bring it back. And they calculate that most of us standing there looking at it and kind of going, well, I could buy it, I might not like it. Oh, I can always bring it back. And most of us don't. And a handful of people buy it, go to a cocktail party, wear it, spill wine on it, and then bring it back and give it back. And they make so much more money from those of us who gained the trust that we might bring it back and could do, but never do, that the handful of people who take the piss out of us are worth having. And you can do that with a 100% money back guarantee. If you put the first person who sold beats from your website and said, buy these beats, if you didn't like it, 100% money back guarantee. Um, you might be, need to be brave to do that. But, um, but you might get yourself in a position where you sell a whole bunch of stuff and very few people would take you up on it. I suggest you do it on a very small subset of your, of your, as an experiment to see whether anybody does before you roll it out across everything. But that's the sort of way of taking trust. A little thing which says guaranteed your money back is a way of scaling trust. Or you can do it by actually meeting people in person and that's harder to scale. So there's a whole bunch of techniques we can start thinking about to make that happen. Yeah, so I have something to say about, so now probably somebody's thinking, how is that applicable to me as a musician? So. What, what can I do with this advice? We're talking about business, about consumers, about trust, you know. So something that comes in mind is when you play, uh, we have a performance, you play a gig, right? You, you are actually transacting with a business. It's the actual venue that expects you to bring some people, to have a fan base, to, to make people have a good time, that to, to be quite easy, you know, while communicating with them, to be on time, to be professional. This is where you can stand out. You can build trust. Somebody, I've heard somebody, I'm not going to say the name, but somebody said that actually the venue, everybody says, oh, venues in London are really bad, you know, they, they, don't, they never pay. Actually, some venues refer to other venues or festivals just because they've been treated right by the artists and they were professionals. And this is where the big fish is. You're not going to sell, you know, like a few CDs on, on, on 10 or 20 people, but you might actually go and play in a festival. And guess what? If you're the most professional and you build trust with the people that can talk about you to scale up, then probably this is the way to go. Right? Just think about, just be clever who you're talking to and what potentially this person can do to your career. It, for me, it's quite simple. But it's about being professional and thinking strategically, right? And obviously not being a bad person. Look, don't Nobody's a bad person. Except if you're Green Day and this is your brand, like destroying guitars or whatever. Destroying guitars doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you a consumer. So I have seven copies of my book. That's all I've got left. So if anybody does want a copy, I'll be retailing at a very cheap price of £15 uh, afterwards. But um, I'm happy to go for a drink and um, catch up more informally. Definitely. Is there, is there any other question? Anybody has there was any... One the, was that wasn't there? Were you sticking your hand up? Yeah, I saw you? a hand here in the middle. started attending this darker talk, we noticed that people are usually um, referring to uh, music as business. What I think that many uh, of you are forgetting is that some of us actually came from the classical department since age four, starting to play your instruments isolated from the rest of the world. Many of artists uh, that I know, and I myself, am uh, very closed and shy. If you're coming to me and talk to me, I'm going to be very open and very warm. But uh, talking with a wide, uh, empty space that is at the other side, and uh, well, when I'm thinking about online contact, it just looks too far. And thinking about that, we really thought like maybe we'll give a try to have some people that could actually do that for us. But then that's not genuine and honest. So what do people that are not outgoing, where, that are not there, that are very devoted to music, really working hard, recording, painting. I mean, I know a lot of painters, one of my best friends, he can't even buy the bus ticket because he doesn't know how to do that. Mm. So he makes ama amazing paintings, but he cannot rely on himself in that sense. So I I'm really curious, is there any kind of a solution for those that do not manage to make People love them, fans, followers, because not everyone is uh, capable or outgoing, or like Tommy, you know, just having mad so, love. So, um, so, so, it, so, I think. Just to make the question a bit broader. You need the microphone, though. 
and I've got one. It's pretty loud voice. So what about the artists that are mysterious by brand? Right, so it includes the introverts, definitely the people that don't want to talk that much on social media, and now they have to, but also the people that, just like Turan the last time, his mm. brand is having a hat, you know, like covering his face and just not talking to anyone. So that's, that's a good question. I think. Well, I think um, two answers. The first one is uh, tough, they're going to have to learn. Um, I think that is, is part of it. Um, it used to be that you needed to be skilled enough to find a relationship with an A&R person or with a, an agent or with a publisher. And now we've replaced that difficulty of networking and access to the movers and shakers in the greater society with a different difficulty of building a relationship with people online, but you can do it from your, loving, from your living room in your underpants if you have to. So we've just replaced one tyranny of how do I get discovered by a magic bullet gatekeeper with a different tyranny, which is how do I build a relationship with thousands or tens of thousands or millions of people online when I don't really want to. Both of those were kind of tough. You have to engage with this in some way. Every so often, somebody got lucky, a mysterious brand or a, um, a, a, a recluse. The quality of their product would shine through. And an A&R person or a, an agent or a publisher would find this thing, which was a, a nugget, and get it published and give solace and heart to all of the people who were rubbish at networking um, that you can get discovered. But broadly, most of the people who were rubbish at networking never got discovered because they were never there. They were never in that place. We've now got the people who are rubbish at online networking will never be discovered. Different skill, different issues, although at least we knew, now have two alternatives. We have the old and the new. So one answer is... The world's not fair, and the world's the way it is, and you need to adapt to the world rather than hope the world will adapt to you. So that's one answer. The second answer is, I think it is possible, particularly if you are part of a band context rather than a solo artist context, to start building relationships to have other people who will do that fandom stuff for you. So I think it is possible to be a, 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 an artist for whom reclusiveness is part of the brand and the hiddenness and have a team who help plant stuff around the web, who help run a Kickstarter for you. What you won't be selling is the direct relationship with the brand or the band, the person. You'll have to think of other stuff to sell that a fan of a reclusive artist who never comes out of his home would want to buy. And that's a creative challenge. I think you're making it harder for yourself by not being public, but you might say, yes, but it's not possible. And I'm saying that I still think this is a better world than the old world, where networking was your only route. Now you've got networking with gatekeepers and networking with the online world. At least you have choices. And I think it is possible to use third parties to do it. I do accept your point. One of the big obvious criticisms about the curve is that if you don't like standing up at things like this and being visible and having arguments in public, which I do all the time on Twitter, then this world isn't a good point. And I go, yeah, I don't make the rules. I just work within the rules. And the rules that I see them are that the world is easier for people who want to build online connections with their fans and is for people who find that difficult. OK, so that's, that's something I like doing. So I'm saying the world is easy for people like me, which is a bit white, middle class, pa patriarchal rubbish. But it is also the case. So um, separately, there is another question. How do we start changing that? Um, and I think that's a much bigger topic. I think it's going to be hard. Um, I think it will happen, but I think, I think it will be hard. Sorry. I think we can always discuss this later, you know, during yeah. the beer. Um, we, we're going to run out of time. So uh, the last person to talk. Lucky you. Make it good. Hi. No pressure. My name's Dan Lee. I front a, uh, a rock band called New Device. Um, we've, had, uh, we've had quite a lot of success over the years, but I've all, my main problem is I've never really been able to find the staff, as in musicians, to kind of um, like just stay with the project because it's just difficult. Trent Reznor couldn't either, so you're all right. But then he fires everyone mm -hmm. because he doesn't like, you know... He because he's a perfe perfectionist. Yeah. Are you? Very much so, but, okay. but at the same time, he likes the kind of raggedy sort of side of things and actually will give people their P45s to just move on, let's get the kind of raggedy stuff back in. I have recently um, set up a street team and these guys that have been working for me, I don't pay them, I talk to them, 
and they have really just kind of, they've done my work for us. Everything on the street team site, they got more hits than the our site, which has over 38,000 likes. And there was more traffic going through What there. is a street team? A street team is like just a whole load of people that we've basically gone, we want you to work for us. Come, buy into it. If you like what we're doing, send out, they basically send out our uh, information, any information we want to do. So like Sherlock's Orphans Gang around London, yeah, kind of his eyes and ears they, around They love around what the we do. They just love what we do. And they, you know, we converse with them, give them little missions to do. They, and they, it started running itself. And how many of them are there? At the moment, like the hardcore, hardcore, like super fans, we've got like about maybe 30, 40. So that's a really interesting point. I've tended to talk about super fans as money. They can absolutely be time, which is what those people are. And they can be, you can, you can harness them yeah. to be evangelists spreading your word, and they're hugely valuable too. And we've got tons of stuff, which, you know, we've got loads of ideas for them, etc. I mean, but I, I myself, I hate, I hate the idea of Twitter. I've always hated it. I have loathed it from the very start. I, I dislike putting up statuses on my Facebook. I'll maybe put up that I bought a new guitar, something like that, every once in a while. Um, and I'm a very private person, but I will interact with people if they pose me a direct question. You're a private person who's the front man of a rock exactly, band. Exactly, but, 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 but that's, that's my face. That's my, that's my... So put your face on on Twitter. But then, so... Am I being absolutely insane by not posting up what I ate for breakfast on Twitter? Or does it have to be something of relevant content within my business? Am, am I, am I, I'm sure I'm missing a trick with it. I'm sure I'm missing a they trick. They are choices, it. but if you put a persona on when you go on on stage, put a persona on when you go on on Twitter. Right. Okay. That's fine. That's, that's, that's my main point. As long as you are authentic to your art, that sounds really pretentious, but as long as you're, you're authentic to the thing that your fans care about being authentic, um, it doesn't matter if underneath that exterior you're actually Dame Edna Edridge. That's fine. Yeah. Um, as long as you're putting out the consistent message that that's you to your fans and that's what they're buying into. At some point, there is a possibility they discover you're actually a 70-year-old Australian man um, <laughs> hiding underneath that and they're disappointed and there is that risk. So I would try quite... Um, I would try and make sure that this is the Twitter account of rock front man... Dave, did you say your name was? Daniel. Is that right? Daniel, sorry. Uh, uh, Daniel. Um, this is a Twitter account of rock frontman Daniel, not the private account of me. By all means, say I have another account for my friends, protected tweets. That's, you don't even need to use it, but you've just made a clear, visible statement to say I have my public account and yeah. I have my private account. I run two Twitter accounts. They both have about 5,500 followers. One's Nicholas Lovell and one is Games Brief. On Nicholas Lovell, I will talk about Ukraine. On Games Brief, I won't, because people follow me on Games Brief are following for games industry insight. Sure. And they're not interested in my political views. Increasingly, I'm not sure they are on Nicholas Lovell, because they follow me for the curve. And I might need a third one, but that's getting too complicated for me to manage, so I'm stopping it too. <laughs> but I think that it's fine to have a, an authentic persona. Think of Twitter as a performance. You know, bite the heads off bats if you need to on Twitter, and that's fine. And that can be separate from what you had for breakfast. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. That was a really nice last question. I think it definitely solves a lot of issues that most musicians will have. So we're going to give it a go now. We're going to call it like the end of the conversation for now. We can continue at the pub. Uh, we definitely have a, a few couple of things you know, before we go. But definitely, hands up. Thank you. Which pub? And as, as always, oh, everybody knows. I would Just like me. to give a hands up to every single one of you for being here and for being that interested. Yes. Thank you. Right. So, one little thing before before we go, um, is Andre here? Andre. Yeah. So this thing would not happen if it wasn't for the partnership of London Fusion. It's something actually you, you might be all interested in since musicians, we need to think as businesses and we are businesses and London Fusion definitely helps with that. So Andre, the facilitator today, will talk a little bit about it. Hello. Great. Thank you. Um, I won't be long. I know everyone wants to get off. Um, yes, you're between them and beer. I am. I'm, I'm the way the pub, so no one's going to be happy with me. Okay, my presentation's died, I don't need this. 
Uh, need it for the video. Need it for the video, because I've got one of these. Oh, is it? Okay. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I did have a pre lovely presentation to show you, but... Oh. Oh. Never mind. So, basically, London Fusion. You can see the banner over there. Um, what we do is we help SMEs, which is small, medium enterprises, in the creative and digital sector. So, anyone who's doing anything creative, which is pretty much everyone in here, or using technology to make their business grow. So effectively what we do is we were given 5.6 million by Europe, European Union, to help this sector in London. So we've been going about two years, we've got about eight months left. The money's running out. So um, we do lots of things to help, from one-to-one -one consultancies, from um, workshops, from supporting events like this with Tommy. Um, we also do things like um, enable companies to work with universities and develop products, services, or whatever it is they need to do. Effectively, anything you need to do to grow what you're doing and become better and make more money and employ people in London and grow the sector. So whatever we can do to help facilitate that, that's what we're here for. So I'll end on that note. If anyone wants to um, talk to me about it or take a flyer from the front, they can take that and um, send me an email. And even if you're not a business, a registered business, you can still email me and talk to me and I can help you get to that stage as well. So I know some people don't see themselves as businesses yet, but as talks like this, great talks like this today, and lots of the talks that Tommy holds show us that even as creative people, we need to think of ourselves in this day and age as creative businesses. And we have to have business models around what we do. So we can help you get to that to hopefully help you focus more on being a creative person. So as I said, anyone wants to get any more details, contact Tommy. Contact me or get some details from the front. And thanks for coming. I think this is our best one yet, our busiest Busy event yet, isn't it? Yeah. So busiest but not the best is what Tommy just said. <laughs> <laughs> busiest and the best. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so the last thing, if you want to write how amazing this was, it's fucking amazing. Just use that. So I'll be there every day, refreshing and seeing who talks about it. Uh, I will send you an email with everything with Nicholas, with contact details about London Fusion, with the slides, with everything, so you don't miss on anything else that happened today. Uh, and definitely I will send you uh, an email with the information about the business model workshops and everything else that we do. That is about educating musicians to become real businesses. This is all this is all, this is all about. So we go for beer at the pub on the right, left-hand side of the corner. Whoever wants to join us, What's it called? feel free. I don't know the name, it's just a Scottish lady that expects us and puts it on the notebook. So, talk with Nicholas. We're going to stay here for 10 more minutes and then we're all going to go because they want to clean the place. And thanks a lot for being here. Last round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.